Welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is nine o'clock, which means it's time for a talk magic. And today I am here with somebody who knows more about bizarre commercial magic than anybody in the world. It is the dark and creepy, the sinister, the one and only Jamie Dawes. How are you doing, man? Are you OK? Hello. Yes, I'm very well. Um, although even now I'm scared of myself. So well, there's that. There's a lot of people that are scared of you, Jamie. Uh, I mean, frankly, with some of the, with your body of work that you've brought out over the years, yeah. <laughs> people out there that are very scared of you. But you know what? I mean, you are so prolific. I mean, you are, you just told me off camera just before we started this interview that you're doing like a self-release every single month this year. On Trying top to. of everything that you've got coming out with people like Kmart Magic and Alakazam and all these different companies, you just like, and, and the interesting thing is everything is just super top, top quality. Everything's brilliant. But I mean, and we'll get into this later on in the interview, but people don't realize how much effort goes into producing one project, let alone 12, where you're doing everything yourself. I mean, how you found time to speak to me, I don't know, but I appreciate it. It's bit literally, I showed you behind me, I've got boxes upon boxes of stuff that I've been packaging for the past two weeks. Mm. Um, yeah, it, you basically become a one man factory. That's the way I put it. Um, you're doing every job on <laughs> in the factory um, subsequently. So, yeah, but it's good fun. I enjoy it. So that's all that matters. And, and you know what? Everyone who buys your stuff, they enjoy it as well. So that's awesome. But you know what? I want to talk to you about creating. I want to talk to you about tricks. I want to talk to you about everything. I imagine most people watching this channel have heard of Jamie Dawes because you're a big name in the community. But just in case there's somebody who hasn't heard of you, I want to just set the scene, do a bit of backstory and find out a little bit more about how you got into magic. So let's start with your origin story, Jamie. What is your origin story? How did you get into, into magic? So my mine's just cl cliche, I'm afraid. Um, so when I was six, my mum bought me the small Paul Daniels magic set, um, which was just a little 50 trick one. Um, but I loved it. It's just something in me really enjoyed it. And I learned them. And I remember like the plastic multicolored cups and balls and the sponge square. It came with a sponge square. And I, to this day, I don't know why. Um, so there was a sponge square in it. and then. I got into Marvin's magic because Marvin's magic was quite big then. And it was on QVC a lot. So I remember um, I've still got this tape downstairs somewhere. I remember staying up one night and videotaping QVC when they did the pub tricks, the, the tube pub tricks that they did on there. Um, and then my mum, basically for every birthday and Christmas, I would always ask for a magic trick. So they would constantly buy me tricks until I had Marvin's magic's entire collection. Um, and then I also had the big magic circle red and green boxes. One was um, card tricks and one was just prop tricks. So I had all of these things. And then when I hit 16-ish um, and I got my first job, I started venturing into London. And then I went to a stall called the Magic Cave, which was in Covent Garden, which was run by um, Lee Hathaway. Um, and it had... Neil Henry working on there and Daniel Young working on there. And we become like a little community of people that would meet up there quite often. And that's where I first met Angelo Carbone, which was just mental at the time. Um, and it was like a, a little hub of, of magicians who would always meet. And I would just hang out there for ages and annoy them probably. Um, and then I used to go to Davenport's and I used to always go in there, which was amazing. Like to see it at Davenport's, um, it's so sad it's gone because it's so many memories for everyone there. Um, and then I just sort of carried on and I've always had performance in me. I've always been a performer, love theatre, musical theatre. My background is actually theatre. That's where I went to university and done a degree in. Um, and then I just started when I was 16, I put I put together my first trick, which was called Scared. Um, self-cutting always ready everyday deck which was named by Angelo Carbone at that stall um, and from that point it just sort of carried on going which is mad because I'm now 31 so considering I was 16 when I came up with scared and now I'm old um, 
Don't say you're old. I'm like 14 years older than you, mate, or something ridiculous like that. You don't know all. I just realised I've just insulted so many people straight away. <laughs> um, you're not old. You're amazing. You're you're maturing like a fine wine. Um, so yeah, it's it's one of those things. Time just gets away with you. Um, and I think of all the people that I've had the opportunity to work with throughout the years. And the really interesting thing about the magic community is you'll meet someone one year. And then you may not work with them for like six years and then something will happen and you'll just coalide again years later down the line. Um, so everyone has this sort of nice tight knit family and, and group of people uh, that talk to each other. So, yeah, that's pretty much the, the story. It's quite a cliche, um, but th all these years on at the age of 31, I'm still going, still going strong. So let's 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 break some of that down and like delve deeper into a bit of that. I don't know the answer to this, so I'm going to ask you. You you are and and have been for a while a professional magician, right? A mm -hmm. full time pro, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I thought. So and and I know you do a lot of restaurant work as well, don't you? Um, so so let's talk about when you started going pro. You talked about hanging out down the cave when you were like 15, 16 years old, 14, but hanging out with some amazing, I mean, the list of names that you just gave me, that Angelo Carbone has become like the number one creator of magic in the world. Uh, Lee Hathaway is the man at the magic circle. Neil Henry is dominating TikTok. I mean, talk about three people that you can hang out with that are good influences on a, on a, on a young guy's career. Um, hundred percent. They're all amazing. Like I remember, cause I knew who Angelo Carbone was anyway. So when you're a kid, when you're like 16, 17 and someone that you really look up to starts like talking to you, it was just mad. And the fact that he, he's such a lovely human being, like just the loveliest man. He, he, he gave his time to me so freely all the time. Um, so yeah, there's, they're all lovely people. And he has no ego at all. Absolutely. No, no none. Yeah. It's crazy to try that talented has no, 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 no ego at all. When mm. did you turn, when did you turn pro then? So you're 16. Did you go straight out of education into uh, performing professionally or was there a transition period? So I went to, I've always been like performing arts. I'm super dramatic. Anyone who's met me will know. Um, so I went through sixth form and I went to a performing arts specialist sixth form. Um, and that was when I uh, did a course called English Communication Studies, um, which is really coincides with magic quite a lot. And it was a really interesting way of looking at things. Um, and then I did music and performing arts. And then from that, because my dream was always to be in the West End, was to be an actor and a singer. Um, and I was classically trained singer at the time. So all the way through my life, I had singing lessons and stuff like that. So then I left college and I went on to university and I did a degree in drama and performance studies. And it was because of that, that the bizarre stuff sorted coming through because my final year at uni, um, we had to put on a performance and the criteria, um, like nothing to do with the fact that I did magic was to try and trick an audience. Um, and because I'm just a bit sick and twisted, um, I decided to fake an acupuncture seminar um, and have the trick go wrong and basically put a needle through someone's arm without them knowing using the needle through arm gimmick. Um, and uh, yeah, so so we basically did that. We hired out like a dentist chair, like a horrible dentist chair, had a funk and ring on um, and I had a lamp. So then when I set off the funk and ring, dropped the lamp, um, put the needle through her arm so when she looked down there was blood um, she wasn't happy um, and then we basically faked everything going wrong so the show was shut down um, I had an actor come in who had like um, a paramedics uniform on so it looked like there's a paramedic and yeah it was it was interesting so I've always had that sort of performance side in me um, and I've always always done magic like around everything I've always found ways to incorporate magic into whatever I was doing um so yeah i don't know that there, there was no real transition it's just always always been a part of my life it's just the, the one strand that goes through everything is magic okay and we're going to talk about creativity in a bit and the different things that you've created but it suffice to say you are known as creating a lot of dark material and a lot of bizarre magic 
Now, you just told me that when you were in college, you scared the crap out of a whole bunch of people in the audience and there's blood and everything. Was that something that, I suppose the question I'm asking is, how did we get from a six-year-old with a Paul Daniels set doing cups and balls with brightly colored cups to scaring the crap out of people and making people believe that like there's blood going everywhere and needles and how did we get from there to there? <laughs> I don't really know because, well, the thing was with, with that project, it sounds like I just went in hard. Um, so part, part of the criteria of that course was to um, find ways to impact people, not necessarily in a positive way, but about triggering other emotions in people. So we weren't necessarily encouraged just to go for a happy thing or, you know, the, the norm. It was to try and find unique and interesting ways to get people to think about things. So, for example, one of my colleagues, um, we had his funeral. So he bought a load of turf, kitted out the theatre like a graveyard, buried himself, got his mum and dad to write a eulogy, and we held his um, funeral. And we all had to put so soil on him. It was a interesting day um and then another friend uh who what was there. fucking college is this <laughs> yeah tell me about it um and then another friend of mine done this amazing performance where she put envelopes underneath spectators chairs and um she had a massive dinner table um and so she said if you've got a piece of paper under your chair can you come up here and can you place your mobile phone on this tray so she got them all to put their phones on the tray and they sat in this this um, dining table and her hook was like the thing that triggered the performance was I've just had a baby girl. And when I had her, I realized that I would kill a thousand people to save my one child, which is a really interesting idea because in, it reminds me of that train thing. Um, a train's hurtling at a group of people. It can't stop. There's one person on one track and a group of people on the other track what do you do? do do you pull it so that it goes towards the one or the group mm. it's one of those the trolley, the trolley problem yeah yeah absolutely so she had this thing um, and her performance was each person sat at the dinner table had to do something gross um in order to get their phone back so the first person had to drink like a, a mixture of fermented eggs and uh, just hor horrible stuff it's gross um, and then person two decided not to do it. So the, the person at the table said, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Of course, I'm not going to do it. I don't care if I'm in a performance. So the girl in my class decided to take this random person's phone. Back, back then, they weren't waterproof, got a massive jug of water and just dropped this person's phone into a jug of water in the middle of a performance. So this spectator from the audience just freaked out, started effing and blinding, stormed out the theatre. <laughs> and we were all just absolutely shocked because our lecturer said you know go hard because it's all about the experience but we didn't know that she was going to be that bad um it turns out it was an actress and we didn't know that so she was a plant um the whole time but the ending of her performance was interesting because she brought out um nappy scrapings and she said to the last person you can either have your phone back and win a thousand pound if you eat some of this nappy scraping um you know like you've got to do it basically and we we're all backstage going oh my god like this is real that really is nappy and the person on stage from the audience was going no it's chocolate of course it's chocolate and we're behind no it's not chocolate please don't do it thankfully they did not do it they did not eat it um so it just that that whole long anecdote there was just to say I was the least bad in that situation. Um, mine, mine wasn't too bad, but mine just had the, the aspect of magic in there. Um, but for me, I, I just like the idea of exploring, like in magic, I don't, I don't think we explore all emotions. Um, and I think that we should be exploring all of emotions because people go to the cinema every year and there are millions and millions of people that go and watch these horror films and love horror films because it's an experience. It gives them an adrenaline rush. Um, they get to be scared, but in a safe environment. And now we've got this massive thing of horror mazes, Thorpe Park, um, Tully's Farm. Um, in America, you've got the Universal Horror Nights. Like They're a big, big thing now. And people love having those experiences. 
So why, as magicians, when we've got these incredible skills and these incredible abilities to create these uh, amazing experiences for people, are we worried about utilizing that because it's not happy or not positive? Um, as long as you give context to what you're about to do, I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. Um, so that's where I came at. I quite like the idea of exploring lots of different avenues and creating lots of different experiences for people that maybe made me stood out amongst other people. Um, well, and I don't have a problem with that. Some people don't like it, but I quite like it. So it's fine. Well, let me ask you a question. I've got a few questions about this. The first question is, do you do, when you're out gigging for real people, not magicians, but you're out gigging for real people, you're in a restaurant, you're at a corporate event, whatever it may be, do you always go hard with the, the with, is it kind of like, this is my brand, this is what people expect me to do? Or are you in a restaurant, will you bust out an ambitious card routine if you need to? Like, where, I, the reason I asked this is because I did a Christmas special on this channel and I reviewed your Christmas trick. Um, Naughty and nice. With the cold, I did it on Ryland and Fear and they absolutely loved it and it's nice and it's lovely and it's fantastic and nobody dies, um, <laughs> which... It's, it, it's not what you expect from a Jamie Dawes, uh, but, uh, but, to be honest. And the same with the, the thing you brought out with Alakazam recently, clued, clued, uh, clued, 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 clued up. That's the Which, one. Or, yeah, technically somebody dies, but it's a very nice, happy trick that's based on um, a, a board game that everyone knows and loves. So I know that not every Jamie Dawes trick revolves around mass murder, but my question, yeah, but my question is, when you're out gigging for real people, what do you do? Do you Are you booked because your brand is this and that's what people expect? Or, yeah, you get what I'm trying to ask. So the, the interesting thing is, I think the more you gig, the more your persona is defined by the people that you're performing for, not, not necessarily yourself. So when I started magic and I started gigging, I was doing things like um, pen through note, um, ambitious card. Uh, uh, one of the first tricks that I learned was a trick from uh, fingers of fury by Alan Morrison. He's got a great um, sandwich trick. So they were fairly standard tricks. And then I started getting a bit more bold with things and I started enjoying bold methods. So Omni deck, um, is quite a bold method. The way I do it is particularly bold. Um, so I, I really enjoyed like those bold things. And then as my magic progressed, I started really getting into mentalism and like mentalism started taking over massively. And I was doing more and more of that, but I still enjoy doing the card tricks. And then I remember being, at, um, I, I watched something about PK touches one day and I went to a Christmas party. A friend of mine has a house party every year, Christmas party. So I, I was there and because I was amongst friends and I felt more confident about it, I tried PK touches. And the reaction to it was something that I hadn't experienced with anything ever. Because these were people that knew me well and had seen lots of magic from me since a young age. But at that moment, I didn't do magic to them as a trick i did magic to them as something that they couldn't explain like that wasn't a magic trick to them that was actual magic and it it was a really interesting um sort of moment for me because I, that's what i wanted like i like the idea of creating moments of magic for people and stories that they can go away and go this guy done this mental thing you're not going to believe it and then they tell this story. Um, and that's just always what I've liked. So mentalism started taking over to the point that now, typically, I'll only have one or two card tricks. So I will tend to open up with um, like an ambitious Icardi sort of thing with an Omni deck ending loaded into a JOL. From that point on, it's mentalism all the way. Um, MD Mini um digital force bag stuff like that but then we go on to the darker stuff and i start putting in at the very beginning of my set i do double cross but i do it with a bizarre twist so i my opening line is um do you believe in voodoo 
So I, I start implanting this idea that there's something a little bit strange from the very beginning. And my character now is they don't know where they stand with me. And at any point, anything could happen. And that's what I love. And that's what they want to see from me now, because I will typically do a trick. Like if I go and do a card trick now, they go, that was amazing, but do something weird. <laughs> and that that's where I'm at. That's that the sort of magic that I now look for are these um, experiences. Um, I know that you did a, a recent review on gravity um, for many years. I've been using another version of that, uh, a predecessor of that called the Scorpion Reel by Bobby Motta. And what I do is I go to a restaurant and I'll hook it up before people get to the restaurant. And I may never use it in an evening or I may use it once. But there's a, a wonderful moment when you're across the other side of a restaurant and you can click your fingers or you can gesture and something can fly off a shelf. And then someone can go over to that thing and pick it up and you never have to go near it. That is an actual moment of magic. Like, it feels completely spontaneous. It feels unrehearsed. It almost feels like it shouldn't have happened. And then if you play it off like it's a completely normal thing to you, to them, it's even more incredible. Yeah. So these little moments of magic that I started putting in, I really enjoyed. And because of what I was doing, PK touches and making, uh, I, I use um, uh, the bone conductory sort of thing as well. So all of these things, you're making people hear things, see things and stuff like that. Um, people just start associating things with you. So I started getting, do you do tarot readings? Well, if I'm getting loads of people ask me that, I need to sort out a trick to do tarot cards. So now I carry a tarot deck and I do a very, very basic reading. Um, and I peek a name that they're thinking of and reveal that at the very end in case anything maybe doesn't go according to plan. So my character now is not necessarily defined by me, but more about what they expect to see from me. Um, and that's how I've sort of started going forward. I always go forward now with trying to find weird ways to incorporate different things. So um, that's the really long way of saying, yeah, I, I do do weird things at a, at a restaurant. Um, and if people ask to see like a scary thing, I've always got, like till death do us part by jim critchlow scream um uh, i've got um he's not here i have a little torn up photo tucked in the zip compartment of my case so i've always got them to go to if i need to go to them if the occasion's right but that's the the main lesson there is if the moment's right if it's for the right audience and i feel like they want to see that from me and they're expecting to see that from me then i'll go and fetch that trick and put that in um, if I feel like it's maybe not great for that group, then I probably wouldn't do that for them. Um, but yeah, I do genuinely do it and I'm not afraid to do that sort of magic because it, it now pits me apart from anyone else that's around my area doing gigs. I mean, we just said that you do a lot of restaurants and I bet you people are coming back in every single week and seeing, wanting to see more of your style of, of performance. That's it comes down to first name basis with some of them now. Um, and they're the great ones. They are the ones that I literally do try random tricks on because they love it. Um, they enjoy seeing it. And they tend to come back with me now and they say, oh, I've, I've learned a trick. I've finally done it. I've learned a trick and I show you it and they'll show me a trick. Um, and that's what it's about. Uh, and that's how I know that for me, those sorts of tricks work because people do come back regularly. They do want to see it. They book me for certain tricks there was one gig that i'd done it was an hour um and they literally just wanted to see pk touches at every table i just went from table to table doing pk touches all night um that was it just one one gig of one trick but if it's what they want that's what you give them if the audience um, want. exactly but yeah so more questions um you mentioned there that a lot of the time you'll open with like an omni deck style routine does a beer? I want to ask you about this debate that's going on in the magic community at the moment, which is should you, if you are considered a mentalist or you do a lot of mental magic, should you insert magic tricks into your set? Does it diminish against the mentalism? And I've spoken to different people on this channel and I've had yeses and nos. Mark Spellman 
was a feminine. No, it makes no difference. You know, you can, I'd love to know what you think, like where, where, because you're doing that, you're going out and you're doing 80% mentalism, but a lot of the time you're opening with what is blatantly a magic trick. Absolutely. Um, my response to that would be that I don't necessarily categorize it as a mentalism trick and a card trick. I categorize it as being a strange trick. So Omni deck, for example, is not your typical card trick. Um, it, it evolves in a way that it feels like a normal card trick. Something weird starts happening. Then something really peculiar happens that's really unexplainable and it turns into a glass block. That's why I open up with that particular trick because it fits my character still. Even though it's not mentalism, there's still that weird aspect in it where, you know, there, there's a, 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 a solid story that they could go away he turned a deck into a, a glass block in my hand which fits perfectly with he drew a cross on, my, on his hand and then it appeared in my hand or um he put his finger on my forehead and then i heard a voice and i know what she was thinking or i have my eyes closed and he tapped someone else but i felt that these are all little stories that feel completely weird and strange but help build my character and my brand so I don't have a problem with mixing mentalism and magic. I, I think that there is, there's a lot of magic theory, but in practice, magic theory is not always right. Um, you, it's great to have theory, but until you go out and you see what people, normal people, not magic people think about these things, then I feel like we live in our own heads a little bit as magicians and we're always theorizing and wondering this and that. Um, the answer is just go out there try it see what happens and then you'll find the answers um so no i don't have a problem but i don't necessarily come at it as mentalism and magic i come at it as that's a weird moment of magic i really like that that's perfect like, for me you're a strange guy and you're going to show them some strange stuff and it might feel like magic it might feel like mind reading it depends on how you right okay that's cool another question one thing that I think that you're really good at, and I've seen it over and over again, is storytelling. I mean, you're, you are one of the best storytellers that I've oh, ever seen. You. Like, you really are. And other people that I've seen that are good storytellers are people that dabble in or completely embrace sort of the bizarre style of magic. And I think that if you have... If you if you do a lot of bizarre magic, you automatically become a great storyteller. People like Eugene Berger, people like yourself, people like, you know, let's look closer to home, Jester Styles, Tom Mullinger, you know. There's a lot of people watching this that struggle with storytelling. And I have been one in the past that's taken the easy option. And rather than trying to weave a story together, it's kind of like pick a card, any card, right? That card, look at the da 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 da, da. And there's no story to it at all uh, because it's the easy, it's kind of the easy approach. As somebody mm. who's so good at telling stories, is there any advice you can give to people watching this on how to actually make your... But first of all, why should they try to incorporate stories into their performances? Uh, and secondly, how would they do that in order to make their performances stronger? Uh, well, the first thing I would say is I genuinely, and I'm not just saying this, I don't believe that I'm a particularly good storyteller at all. I believe that I do just tell stories. Um, and sometimes that's all you need. All you need to do is to tell stories, to be good at telling stories. Um, but the other thing that I would say is, is a nice little callback to earlier on when I said I did a course about English communication studies. And essentially the course is looking at... Um, how we represent information. Um, for example, how we interpret pictures or video and how we take information from those things and how that may be able to be manipulated. Uh, um, and one of the things that they spoke about on the course was how, as human beings, we talk in stories. It's, it's a natural thing in human beings that, you know, there must be a time that you've been at home and you said, ah, oh, Today at work, you wouldn't believe it. Sally came over and she had this and that happened. And oh, it's just so, it's so frustrating. And in that moment, you're telling this story and you're passionate about it and your emotions coming through and you're gesticulating and you're excited and you, you can, 
you're giving that emotion away to other people. So when people say that they're not good storytellers or they're worried about storytelling, you're a storyteller. We are all storytellers. It's about having the confidence to tell a story. Um, one thing that I like doing is if anyone's come up to me and see me do scream or he's not here or one of the story tricks at a stand, every dem that I do, every magician that I do it to, I go hardcore with them. Um, I will make them jump. I'll soften my voice. I'll, um, I'll make sure that they are in that moment with me, wh whoever it is, however many times. And I'm not afraid to be over the top and a bit scary or a, a little bit, you know, OTT with it. It doesn't matter because I'm trying to create an experience. And whether you're a magician or a member of the public, I still want you to feel that. I want you to enjoy that moment. Um, so if you're wanting to tell stories, you're a storyteller just don't be afraid to tell stories um look at other people look at how excited they get and remember those feelings when you're telling them um, and the last thing that i say is always come from a place of truth or a place of experience so even these horror stories that i write um like i've got loads of horrible stories that i've written um one of the ones that i could tell you is um based on a true story which is just a mental story is about a woman called Susanna Cartwright. Um, and she basically found out her husband to be was cheating on her. So instead of just telling him, she plotted his murder. And on the night of their wedding, after they got married, she waited till he was asleep and he had a shotgun hanging on the wall. She took it off, pushed it into his forehead, pulled the trigger and killed him with one bullet. And she took his wedding finger with his ring still on and she cut it off with a kitchen knife and put it into a envelope. And she sent it to the police with a note saying, um, my husband's played so many games with me. I'm going to play a game with him. You better find his mistress before I find her first. And then the police just went on this wild, wild goose chase. It's just, it's just mental, right? Don't ask me where I find these stories from. Um, but that, particular story when i first um wrote it because none of that is real but it comes from a place of truth when i'm telling it to you because much like a playwright would write an entire backstory i know everything about susanna i can tell you what she looks like i can imagine what the house looks like um i can imagine probably what their bedding looks like they've got a history together in my head this story is real and as i'm telling it to you it's a real story that i'm telling so when I'm relaying it to you, I'm, I'm hoping that you feel that emotion. Um, and the, the easiest way that I can put that is, has anyone ever told you a ghost story? And as they're telling you that ghost story, you get the hairs on the back of your arm start standing up and you get a bit, oh, like, oh, oh, I don't like that. That's, that's weird. The reason that you get that is not the story, but it's the emotion that you're seeing in someone else telling you the story. So much like a film, if you take the music away from a film, it's not scary. A horror film is not scary. You put the music in, that's what makes it scary. When someone's telling you a story, it's not necessarily the story that's scary. It's the emotion that, that's coming through as they're telling you the story. That's what's making you believe it. This person's coming at you from a, a perspective of truth. You have no reason to doubt this person. They have no reason to doubt their beliefs and what they've seen. So you then buy into it and you believe it. So when you're telling a story, just believe it. Like start, start believing it. Um, one of my favorite pieces of magic that I've ever come up with is not a bizarre piece. It's a trick called love and war. Um, and it is a romantic trick. And it's, it's one of the best selling tricks that I've ever had. Um, which is weird because it's just like a little download thing. Um, but you'll see the people comment underneath the, the trailer and the video, just what an amazing story. Like it's such a touching thing. Um, and that like when, when I tell that story, I get so choked up with it. Like I get so emotional with it um, because it's just a lovely story. And it was actually based on a story um, from a book called Dirty White Boy, Tales of Soho, which was uh, the actual story was about a guy that owned uh, um, an LGBT clothes shop um, in, in the middle of London. And these two guys used to come in and talk about their long lost love. 
and then it transpired that they were each other's long lost love and the shopkeeper just didn't realize that they were on about each other for years so they were literally in the same shop looking for each other but never knew that the other person was there so then um i sort of just took that story and created a, a slightly more commercial version but in my head everything was planned out everything was completely believable like i really believe it when i'm telling the story um, and because it's based on that true story it gives it helps me give a bit more emotion to it because i know that that is something that could happen and basically did happen it's just i've put it in a slightly different context to make it a bit more commercial um so yeah there are lots of different ways to tell stories but the again the short answer to a very long answer is you are a storyteller um just have confidence in yourself to tell stories do you use stories as a source of inspiration? And what I mean by that is, do you like listen to a story and go, I bet I can use that in a trick? Because I've never seen anyone else say that ever. I've asked the question a million times, can you give some advice on creativity? No one's ever said they find a story and that's the basis of a trick. But it sounds like that's something that you do an awful lot. Yeah, well, I'm I'm actually like a big, softy, emotional person. I'm one of the ones that can watch a sad film and like I'm gone, or um, uh, not even a sad film. Like I'm I'm one of the ones that there's a happy ending, and I'll literally be like, yes, great. Um, like I said, I'm very dramatic. Um, so sometimes I do. For example, so we were talking about the given, which is um, a past release. And that came from a true story. So the story, uh, I was looking into the Salem witch trials and there was a story about this woman called Bridget Bishop. And the idea was that during the Salem witch trial, she was the most accused person. So she had the longest criminal record. And it was weird things like she wore the color red, which was a sign of the devil, or she had late night parties, or she had more than one husband, maybe at the same time. So that was where that story started. And then I just elaborated on that story and uh, I came up with this hook that um, uh, those people, those witches at the Salem witch trials, some of them were actual witches and they belonged to Motto, M-O-T-O, which was written about in a couple of books, which was the movement of the occult. And these actual witches believed that the devil or Satan was going to give them someone, the given, um, to, to make all of this stuff go away. And they always refer to her in texts as the given so that they would never actually use her name. And they always believe that Bridget Bishop was the given. So all I've done is I've taken the actual story of Bridget Bishop of this woman and then uh, twisted a couple of things and added a couple of things in. So there's enough truth there to hook things, but there's enough there to make the method and the trick work as well and make it unique. That's crazy. And what's hilarious, well, not hilarious, I don't know how to describe it, is you must be the only person in the world that just nonchalantly says, I was looking into the Salem witch trials, as you do. Yeah. You know, had a bit of downtime, thought I'd check out the Salem witch trials. Said nobody well, ever, but Jamie Dawes. I, I, I literally, I had the idea for a witch trick because I really, I love the story of the Salem witch trials. I think it's a fascinating story anyway. Like if you tell, a member of the public about it it's a genuinely engaging and interesting story so it, it's natural that it would lend itself to a bizarre trick um, and loads of people have in history have, have gone gone through the idea of witches in in magic anyway um, but i will say that the bizarre community as a group of magicians is probably one of the tightest group of magicians and they're so devout about what they're into like there are very few um, bizarrists or bizarre magicians who aren't really into the subject matter or really into creating those moments of, of magic and weirdness. Um, so I guarantee that there are probably tons more magicians out there that go even more in depth than, than I do in these things. Do you ever find that you get yourself to a gig and, and storytelling is just not an option. Like I've done gigs at Christmas where you're in a room where there's 50 tables, there's 20 people on each table. There's a DJ who apparently doesn't understand what background noise is, what background mm. music is. And you're walking up to the table and you're like, 
hello, and they can't hear you. You could scream into the guy's ear, hello. And so you end up just doing some flashy coin stuff, solve Rubik's Cube, right, move on. That's a environment. Now, what do you do in that situation? Do you just like not take a gig like that because you know it's not going to fit your brand and you get and you pass it on to somebody else? Or do you to get, get a gig like that and you go, right, fuck it. And you just get your, your, you know, I know that you've got the ability to do that gig. You've got the skills to do it. Do you just adapt? What, 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 how would, would you approach that sort of scenario? So I, I, I'm the, the same. Sometimes you don't know that these things are going to be at a gig, though. That's the thing. Sometimes you do take a gig and you think it's not going to be that bad. And you get there and it's just full on. Or there's a band or something. The bands are even worse than DJs. No offense, bands. I love you. Live music. It's awesome. <laughs> um, uh, in that instance, uh, I would say things like PK touches don't really require a lot of speech. You can do a PK touch routine pretty much without saying anything and people can understand what's going on. Um, the version of PK touches that I do is a multi-layered routine using different people's methods, some of my own, some of other people's. Um, but I always end it with a trick called D'Angelo's touch, which is a wonderful version of PK touches, um, which is more of a display for other people. So if I'm at a restaurant, for example, at the beginning of the night, I'll tend to do it maybe once or twice. And I'll get someone at the table to stand up, move out of the table, and I'll do D'Angelo's touch to them. And they can see these people, everyone else in the restaurant can see this guy putting his hands up. And it's immediately apparent to everyone in the restaurant what's going on without any context of what's going on. And instantly they know who I am because they know that there's a magician there or it's got to be the weirdie that's doing this thing to people. Um, and... Uh, they, they, they can just see this moment of magic and be in it. So by the time I'm at the table, they sort of have an idea what I'm about and what I'm going to be doing. Um, and they're going to want to see it. But again, that's, that's a, an example of a trick or, or double cross. If we're all honest, double cross is such an incredible trick. You don't need a huge amount of presentation to pull that off. You know, close your hand. Great. Draw it on, take it off, throw it open up your hand, freak out. That's a trick that doesn't really require a huge amount. Omni deck doesn't really require a huge amount of context there. There's your card. Is that your card? Great. Turn it down, put it in, snap. It's back on top. They'll freak out. Um, turns into a glass block. No explanation necessary. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think, like I said, it's not necessarily the storytelling, but the weird moments that create stories. So you can create stories without having to say things. Um, and like I said, even the wiping your hand and making something fly off a table from the other side of the room. Like everyone's seen Matilda. You don't get more magical than that. That's very true. That's very, very true. And that's an amazing advice. Now, I want to move on and speak about you as a creator. Because obviously a lot of people that are watching this will know of you as a creator. Now you talked about how you created your first trick, scar scared, um, in when you were 16. Did you create that to sell? Like what was your reasoning behind being a creator? Why did you start creating magic? Because you've created and released so much magic through the years. And there's so many Jamie Dawes effects, whether it be downloads or physical products. And we're going to get into that. But what was the original reason behind it? And the reason I ask you this is because, you know, you said you're 31 now. You started creating magic when you were 16. That's kind of like 15 years ago. 15 These days, we put creators up on a pedestal. New people that come into magic, they kind of immediately look around and go, well, well I want to create magic as well. I want to be revered like Greg Wilson or whoever the person is. And a lot of people create magic before they're ready. And that's, that's great. So what, what, but I, it wasn't like that back in 15 years ago, you, you know, uh, 15 years ago for people that are new to magic that are watching this, there weren't tricks coming out all the time every day. Like you didn't have like 30 tricks a day and millions of downloads. It was kind of like L and L bought one DVD set out a couple every quarter and that's about it. And you, you know, it was very, you know, it, that was it. So what made you want to create magic, Jamie? I think it would help a lot of people that are watching this. I want to talk about you as a creator, but what was your reasoning behind it? 
I think so. The first trick that I came up with, the truth is, I was on a holiday um, in Tenerife or somewhere like that. And we were going to this bar and I was showing card tricks to the bar owner and stuff and they were loving it. And at the time I was obsessed with haunted decks because it's one of the most interesting card tricks, I believe, because it's using a, a prop that's sort of synonymous with magicians and what we do, but using it in a completely different way, like making the deck of cards cut themselves. And I remember I was uh, learning a version of the trick by Mozik. Um, I think it's called Spirit. And it's super, super smart. Um, and then I was looking at uh, another version called Jumping Jack Flash, which was brought out by 452 Productions at the time by Stephen Tucker. And both of them were like super cool, like amazing methods. They were great. I loved them. And then I was on holiday and I was like, I really want to show a haunted deck to these people i think they would love it and i remember sitting on the beach going i just don't have the gimmick the gimmick's in england i'm here like but i wish wish i could do it and i remember sitting down on the sunbed looking at a card thinking there's got to be something that i can do to this card now that does the exact same thing as those gimmicks but just a card and it was just a weird eureka moment i went well if i just do that it does the same thing and I did it and it worked. And then I went to the bar that night and I showed them the trick because theoretically I practiced it loads because it's the same gimmick, just a different fashion of that gimmick. Um, and then I did it. And then I remember showing it to Cameron Francis and Peter Egging and Dave Forrest. And like they were just like, that's mad good. That's like, amazing that you can do this thing, but impromptu with a normal deck of cards that you would have a gimmick for. And that was when I was like, oh, maybe there's something in this. It'd be really cool to see if other magicians like it. So I wrote up a PDF and that's how I released the first one. And at the same time, I was coming up with a trick called gathering. And the idea was that you punch two holes in a card and you link a finger ring on because I really liked impossible objects at the time. And that was when Hypercard, if you remember, Hypercard was about. Um, and I just love like weedy objects. So I was like, well, if I had a weedy object, what would it be? I loved ring flight routine. So I was like, well, a card, a ring on a card. And I wrote up the PDF at the same time. And I put scared and gathering out with merchants of magic at the same time. And um, it just went mental. Like scared was received so well by so many people, um, which is weird when you're a 16 year old and you've got, you know, Cameron Francis, who I'd watched on BBM's DVDs and Omega Mutation and um, yeah, just Dave Forrest, who I'd watched all of his DVDs, like praising your trick. It's, it's just bizarre. So, so bizarre. Um, and those were the people that I looked up to. And you said that they put creators on a pedestal. I'll go out on a limb right now and say that I don't believe that a creator is any better than anyone else in the magic community. And I don't believe that anyone is any better or any worse at what we're doing. You may just have different skills to someone else, but it doesn't necessarily make you a better or a worse magician or a performer. Yeah. Um, and people that put like creators on a pedestal and stuff like that, you really shouldn't because they're just normal people that happen to have an idea. And one day the likelihood is you're going to have an idea. And it's just what you want to do with that idea, which is going to define whether you're a creator or a normal magician, you know? So I don't believe that I'm anything special or what I do is special. And I equally don't believe anyone else is special. Like I just think everyone's amazing at what they do and, and take them for face value. Um, but in saying that in those days, those were the people that I looked up to. Um, so yeah, it was mad. But since that moment, it sort of just snowballed and, I enjoy the process of creating magic. Like I love creating magic. Um, I get more enjoyment out of creating magic now than performing it. And I love performing. It's my whole life, but there's just a buzz that I get seeing another magician perform your trick. And at a convention, when someone comes up to you and says, I showed this at a competition and I won it, or um, I showed this to my family and they loved it. Those are the moments that you go, 
that's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm sitting down, sticking 600 envelopes or, you know, cutting 5,000 cards and super gluing magnets on them or whatever you're doing. Those are the reasons that you do it. Those are the, the amazing moments. Um, so yeah, ever since then, I've just started just releasing more because if I like the ideas, maybe someone might like them. Um, or I'll just annoy someone doing scream over and over again at a convention either way. <laughs> so have you got any advice for people that want to create magic, whether it be for their own act or whether it be to uh, release commercially, any advice on, on the creative process? Uh, because you've said to me in the past, anyone could create a trick. Anyone could be creative. Uh, I, I think there's going to be people watching this that would probably go, no, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to. I just sit there and it just doesn't come to me. Uh, but I know you you strongly believe that anyone can create magic. So do, do you have any advice on how to uh, how that creative process looks for you? Um, I would say much like earlier on when I said, you know, people who want to tell stories, you're already a storyteller. If you're a magician and you're going out and you're doing a trick and you're presenting it your own way, then you're a creator. You've already created something yourself. You've created a new script. You've created a new way to perform something. You are already a creator. You've, you've created something. Um, so you're already halfway there. If you want to create your own trick, I would say have a reason for that trick to exist. So when I started creating bizarre tricks, it was because I really like storytelling and there aren't many storytelling tricks on the market. Even now, there's not many. Um, so uh, my, my want and my desire to put out bizarre tricks and to have more tricks like that that I could perform is why I started creating bizarre tricks. But at the same time, things like um, Clued Up, um and phantasm and uh love and war and all the the nice tricks that i've come up with the reason i put out love and war was um i just wanted a nice romantic trick for gigs there weren't many romantic tricks about i could think of like a handful um so i wanted to create this really nice moment with a photograph that they could remember and it would give them a really nice feeling so always have an intention and a reason to create but realize that you're already a creator because you're already putting routines together. So again, I think it's about belief and I think it's about changing the way you think about things. Um, don't desire to be something because you already are that thing. You're already a creator. You just have to realize that you are a creator and you're already doing it. Mm. So where do you find the hook from? Because one of the things that I've seen over and over again with the tricks you release is there's always a very strong hook you know, there's always that moment that grabs people's attention. And I've talked about this on the channel before. I've talked about the importance of getting people right from the very first second and having that initial hook that draws people in. And that's what your tricks have in spade and then some. And so any advice on, 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 on cause creating, but actually developing that hook as opposed to just Right, let me let me show you my next four ace routine that I've created. You know, this is the millionth four ace, but I'm going to make the four aces jump around. Okay, there's no hook there. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I don't know. I think it just makes magic interesting. Like to have that that little thing that makes people's ears prick up and go, "What? What was that? What? What was that thing?" Um, like like I mentioned earlier on about the ghost story, when you hear someone telling you a ghost story, it's interesting because there's something weird going on in the story and you don't know where it's going. So why would you not put something at the beginning of your magic or in your magic that makes people go, what? What was that? Um, and I mean, we do have performers coming out like Ben Hart is doing this sort of thing. Great where he puts like a, a strange hook on it which feels almost um, phantasmagoric in, in the way it's put together. It's all a bit um, weird and interesting. So there are people out there that are doing it. Um, but for me, the hook just has to be interesting. It doesn't even necessarily need to be relatable to people. Um, I mean, Clued Up is, works really well because it's so relatable. That's a relatable prop. There's nostalgia there. Um, everyone knows what Cluedo is or in America, Clue um so it's a really nostalgic prop but 
if I bring out a bunch of photos of um, like black and white photos, I can bring context to that, but it doesn't necessarily have to relate to them. But if that's the case, then it needs to be interesting. So if I start talking to you about the Titanic, that's already an interesting story. Yeah. So you're already halfway there. If I start talking to you about the Salem witch trials, that's already an interesting story. So I'm halfway there. If I tell you a ghost story, I'm halfway there. If I tell you a love story with a twist at the end, um, that there's another great thing. I love twist endings, like massive fan of twist ending films and stuff like that. Um, so for me, a hook either has to be relatable or, um, you know, just interesting. Just find something interesting or even something bizarre and off the cuff. So just say something very strange, like, um, do you believe in voodoo? Like, what a statement at the beginning of a gig to give someone. Like, it's a very bold statement, but it's great. That is, that is, <laughs> that is absolutely fantastic, and it's so true. But I want to, I, I, let, me, let me ask you about the commercial side of releasing magic now, because you've released magic through so many different companies. Um, you talked about the Merchant of Magic, Dominic. Um, obviously, you, you, and we'll talk about this later on, but you, you're very linked with Alakazam. Uh, I, I know that you, you've shown me you've got things coming out with Kmar Magic, and, and I know there's other companies you've worked with as well, but you also self-publish an mm. awful lot. So I suppose my question is, let's say there's somebody watching this and they fancy themselves as a creator, They've got a trick, they've worked it in, they think that it's good. Um, they've checked with colleagues and everyone says it's original, it's unique. What should somebody do if they want to release that magic trick? Should they go to a dealer? Should they uh, self-publish it? I mean, you do both. So what, what advice have you got on this side of things? Because this is something that a lot of people want to know. I think it depends what you want out of it. I mean, I've been, like you said, I've been doing this for 15 years now. And I've got like the people that buy from my website and my tricks are like, again, it sounds really cliche, but they are just amazing. Like they're so supportive and you always see the same names that pick up the stuff. And they're the ones that send you the emails telling you about what's going on. And um, that's the thing over so many years, you do pick up a following of people and, um, so it sort of makes sense for me now at this point in my career to start. I've got, I've literally got so much material from 15 years worth of creating. Um, and each year we do something called the Alakazam Academy. And I've been doing that for four years. It's going to be the fifth year um, at Halloween. And I think we've come up with like 10 or 12 hours worth of bizarre material um, over those four years and each of those things are marketable uh, like individual tricks but normally you'd need to source the props and you would need to make this and get that so it makes sense to package them up so that people can actually start performing them as opposed to try and source this and get that and grab this and that um, so for me in my career it makes sense to start doing this now um, and start self-producing stuff but equally, there's a trick, for example, I came up with about a month ago, which is just mad good. Like, and, and that sounds so big headed. And I get that that sounds big headed, but it's not me. I think as a creator, if you're not passionate about your, create, yeah. your creation, it's like I've got a friend who's a motivational speaker. His name's Brad Burton. He says, don't have a plan B. Because if you have a plan B, it means that you don't believe in your plan A. If you don't believe in your plan A, why should anybody else buy into it as well? So I, I, I no, I, I think you should be loud and proud. And, you know, I, I love it when I hear creators say, this is the best trick ever, especially when they believe it like you do, because that says, hey, I believe in this, you know. I mean, so, the, this thing, though, that I've put to it's one of those things where I thought about it for maybe three years, like, and that's not an exaggeration. It was literally a thought in my head. And I loved the, the original version, but I was like, no one's ever bought anything out since that. That is not a prop I would ever use. That's not a prop anyone would ever use, but it's a super clever trick. So how would I incorporate that in a completely different way? And I came up with this, this concept in my head and I was like, right, I'm just going to sit down and make it. 
And it took me maybe five, six hours to make the prototype of it, just cutting card and putting plastic sheets on and coloring things in and making it look decent. And then I remember I didn't even tidy up the room. It was carnage with paper everywhere and card and knives and sticky tape. And I remember filming it and sending it straight to Peter Nardi. And I just went, look at this. Like, this is so good. And he literally was just like, what the hell? Like, that is amazing. Like, that's incredible. And I said, surely there's a way that we can make this a thing for other people. But in order for us to really produce it, it needs to be injection molded or, you know, done overseas in a factory, essentially. And I don't have the capability or the inclination or, you know, the finances to do that. Whereas a company like Alakazam and Pete will be able to do that way better than I could ever do. And it really is a prop that I know magicians all over the world will use this in their stage shows all the time. And it will be a staple part of their show. And it is super commercial as well. So unlike my bizarre things, which I would say are a bit more niche, this is literally for any performer. So for me now in my head, I go, well, I can't do it. I need to approach a company. The company that I trust most because I have so much history with them is Alakazam. Um, and I know that Pete has the, the resources and he has the um, contacts to do it. But more than that, I know that he has the passion for the project because I saw his reaction to it. And I know that he's as into it as me. And even clued up, I remember phoning Pete up very early morning because he was still having breakfast with harry and i said look i've made this trick it's a bit ropey because i've made it out of um uh, cluedo cards but I, I showed him it and he literally just went yep we're putting that out and there was no hesitation it was just yes that we're, we're doing that one and that's what you want you want someone whoever's producing the trick to be as in to it as you are because then you know it's going to be produced, you know it's going to be the best quality that it can be, and you know that everyone is on the same um, playing field as you are. Yeah, absolutely. That's, wow, <laughs> I'm excited about it, and I have no idea what it is. That's cool. So, okay, so for somebody's new release, would you suggest not self-publishing? If you've got no name, nobody knows who you are, you haven't got an email list, nobody knows who you are as a creator, would you suggest tr building up a name by going through a dealer that you can trust that that's got a track record of producing products first before you go down the self-publishing -publish route? See, now this is the hard thing, and you've been like around magic for ages. So you'll notice that 15 years ago, when I was like 16, PDFs were just new. Like PDFs were just coming in. Yeah. So that's why when I was younger, I could self-produce. And that was fine because there was loads of heat on, on PDF. So if you put a PDF out, you were going to make sales. You were going to sell it. Um, whereas nowadays, not that this is necessarily a bad thing, but we do have lots of platforms that allow self-publication en masse. So we now have a situation where not only do we have lots of professionally marketed tricks going out there, but we also have lots of self-produced stuff going out there. Yeah. And if a massive marketed trick only has two weeks shelf life, then your download has even less shelf life. Like there are literally like 40 being put on a website a day. So nowadays, it's a lot harder, I think, anyway, I believe, to self-produce um, if you've not done anything before. So that's when I think it is probably better to go through a company because it's within the company's interest to push you and promote you as well because they need to sell that trick. They've invested in that trick. Um, so they will help you along and they'll help you produce the trick and they'll help you with your publicizing and your advertising and um if you get a really good company that stands behind you and helps push you forward um like your alakazams like your kmart i'm just going to name drop those two because they're the two that i work with the most but even back in the day 452 dave forest like 
really believed in what he was doing. He's passionate about those magic, yeah. uh, th those tricks. And th those are the sort of people that you want to look for. So nowadays, if it was me in that position and I was starting from scratch again, I think I would go through a company. I think I would find a company that I trust, a company that I feel like fits the product, a company that I feel like I can trust. Um, and I would go straight through them, I think. Okay. Okay. And I think that's important. The whole finding a company that you can trust. I think you have to have that trust there. Um, else you're never going to know. No, that's really good advice. Um, can I ask you a little bit more about Alakazam? So how, you, your name has become linked with Alakazam. Like every month you're on the, uh, you're on the, um, yeah, the weekly show. A lot of the time, you're on the weekly show. Uh, you also uh, you're also heavily involved with a lot of the live product launches. Um, lots of other stuff. The Alagazooms, the Discord channel. You you get involved with an awful lot of it, which is and and you do it for the love of it. You know, what I mean, which is which is amazing, absolutely amazing, and it's raised your profile huge, massively. Um, how how did that? How did you, how did it come about? Because I've had conversations with Pete Nardi, obviously. And, and, and when I speak to Pete, he talks about you in such a positive way. Like, oh my gosh, I, he, it feels that Pete, you're the first go-to guy that Pete goes to when he's got a product. Like I've, I'm working with Alakazam on a couple of different things, as you know. And Pete will ring me up and he'll go, I've just sent it to Jamie. He loves it. It almost like, Almost like he needs to get your opinion before he's 100% sure on something, you know? Uh, it, you're absolutely in that inner circle, which is, which is incredible. Where did, where did that all uh, come from? Uh, I mean, I, uh, I don't think my opinion matters that much um, to him, but um, the, uh, do you know, it goes, it goes back to when I was 16. So I came up for an idea for a color-changing deck. And back then it was when Christian Schenk from Card Shark was sort of coming through the ranks and building up his company. And he had a service where you could pay to have a deck made. So I had this deck made up and it was looking back on it now, awful. <laughs> it was just so bad. Um, and I remember I practiced it and I thought it was a great idea. Um, and so the idea was that the, the, the deck would change color and then the whole deck would turn blank. So that, that was the only card that they could have picked out. But it was just the whole deck was hardcore gimmicked. It was awful. Um, and I remember sitting in his office and I'd seen all of the Alakazam releases because I was a big Alakazam fan when I was a kid. And I had all of Andy Nyman's stuff. Um, and I had like the Hidden and, and Killer Elite and just all of these things. So then when I was in the office... I remember just shaking. I was so scared and so nervous. And although Pete is like a big softie, he's, he's a big teddy bear, really. When you hear him on a trailer, he's got that really South London gangster accent. He really has, yeah. And I remember thinking, like, if this goes wrong, does he? is there like a room that he's just going to take me in and then I'm just going to get beaten up? Or like, how's, is this like room 101? Do they just pull it and I'm going to fall through the floor? There's got to be something that's going to happen here. So I was so scared, but he was just so like inviting and just so nice and warm. And like, it was just, a, he's just so nice. Um, and then several years later, I was at university. I think I was about 19 at this stage. And I came up with a trick called Phantasm, which was like a card warp style thing, but it was like, looked like a camera trick. So things would happen really visually. And then there was an impossible object. I said that I was obsessed with impossible objects. This was when I was exploring them. And the cards end up being permanently stuck together. So you do this thing with all these cards and they end up being stuck together. And I remember being on the train and I sent him the trailer, the, the, not a trailer, like a, a basic video. And he literally just went like, you've got it. That's the first trick that we're going to put out with you. And I remember going down to the studio and we filmed with Russ Stevens, who was um, his video um, guy at the time. And that was sort of where it all began. And then I was 
putting out um, bits and pieces here and there. Then I got involved with 452 Productions, who basically saw Scared and Gathering, which were the two tricks from when I was 16, and said, look, I think they deserve a, a bigger stage. I think we should produce them to DVDs. Um, and then Pete helped me out with some other stuff to do with that as well. And ever since then, we just carried on this um, sort of conversation and we were always like talking every now and again. And I was probably just bugging him and he hated me, but I'm here. So it worked. Um, and we just carried on talking. And then for the past sort of must be about six or seven years now, um, I've just got to know them even more. And we started producing the dark series, which was a series of dark tricks with them and, I've, I don't know how many tricks I've got out with them now. And we started the, I was one of the first adopters of their Academy series, which I loved. Um, and I've got some amazing memories. And then I got to help and, and know Harry a bit more and to see where he is now and see everything that he's achieved in such a long time, uh, such a short time is just mad, incredible. And he's such a lovely human being as well. He's such a nice person. So yeah, it's just sort of grown. And the thing is, you you begin to you you trust people because if people put time into you, and if people give you their time without wanting something back, those are the ones that you know you want to work with because you know that they're not always just in it to make sales or to make money. They care about the relationship that they have with people, um, and they've been like that with with everyone like even when i've gone around to the house for dinner and stuff like that they're just the most lovely accommodating people jenny pete's wife's just just so uh, lovely if you don't have a drink in your hand in her house it, she will tear her hair out um because she, she just has to be the the good host and mm -hmm. um, because she's just that kind of person so yeah ever since then i've sort of um just been around them and i'm always happy to help um, but the helping part isn't necessarily Alakazam. Um, if I'm in a position to help someone, I think it's my duty to be able to help people. So even with like the magic circle or uh, like the apprentices, or if someone needs help with something via um, Zoom or whatever, a lot of the time I'll just try and help. Because I think if all of us as magicians gave an hour a week to another magician without wanting anything back, then the community would be even more awesome than it is. I completely agree, 100%. That's such an amazing attitude. Um, I wanna ask you one more question before we wrap this up. And the final question I wanna ask you is, do you have any advice on, not creativity, we've talked about that, but taking a trick and making it your own? And the reason I ask you this is because obviously we've got to know each other a lot more recently because uh, of, of my release gossip through Alakazam. And I remember Pete turning around to me and saying, well, Jamie's been working on this. He's got some good ideas. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. I'll... And, and that was a massive understatement because I mean, the stuff that you had and put together with gossip, like I've been working with this thing for 10 years and I didn't think for a second about creating an impromptu wiki test or using it as a one ahead principle and I, I like mind-blowing and and you've taken a product that I thought I'd kind of finished I thought it was done it was perfect and then you came up with a whole bunch of other stuff that you could do with it and I've seen you do that over and over again with many many different projects not just your own but other people's. And I know that that's one of the reasons that Pete goes to you because he knows that you can show you something and you can say, well, how about this, 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 and this. Is that something that's unique to you or is that teachable? I mean, how, how do you do that? How do you look at a product? Because that's the holy grail for a magician, let's be honest, to be able to take a product that everybody is using and do it in a completely different way and make it your own. And that's something that you do a lot. So how, how would, is, is there any advice you can give us on that? Um, I don't know. I mean, gossip's an amazing trick anyway. So it didn't need any more input. It's just a different take on something, isn't it? Um, but what, again, what I really like about Alakazam is Pete gives the space for an idea to breathe. So instead of just going, that's it, that's done, 
he'll sit down and he'll brainstorm like 15 other things that you can do with it. Um, and sometimes those things are nearly as good as the original concept. Um, not, not, not with gossip because gossip was awesome as it was. Like I literally, when Pete gave it to me in November time, um, I took it into, cause I was working throughout the pandemic in a, in a local school and I took it into to the kids, the, the care worker kids and stuff. And they just went mad for it. They absolutely loved it. Um, they just were like, they, they just couldn't get their heads around it. They freaked out. It was great. So I knew straight away it was like a working trick. Like if you can get it past kids, let, let alone the wife or the girlfriend or, or the husband test, like it's all about the kids. If you can impress a kid, you're fine. Um, so I knew it was going to be fine. Um, but then a lot of the time, you know, they say that if you constantly think in a certain way, then you're always looking for those patterns. And the way that my brain works is I'm constantly never turning off looking at things like a trick. Like I literally will look at everything in a room and think of different things that I can do with it or different tricks that, that are doable with it. It's just it's literally just how my brain works now. Um and I think that's just because I, I create and I obsess over creating um, and I obsess over methods. I love, I'm one of those that loves collecting methods in my head because I know that when I need those methods, they're up there. Yeah. And I prefer to have a catalog of methods in my head for when I need them than not having them at all. Um, so I, I constantly just think that way like all the time so when pete or anyone shows me a trick a lot of the time i go oh man that's awesome but have you thought you could try this with it and it might that might work and sometimes it doesn't hit sometimes i'll say stuff and it's like what what was i going on about um but sometimes i, I was quite happy with the wiki test um idea with gossip really? like that was one when i was thinking about it i thought oh that would be really cool That'd be a great thing to do. Or the um, uh, the the way that you can get someone to think like that systematic way of thinking. Um, so I don't know. I think the more that you think in a certain way, the more you'll act that way. So the more you think about creating methods, the more you're always just going to see methods in things and find different ways of doing it. Um, and I think it's really important to have a group of people that you send your magic to and get input on it because everyone will have a different take on it. And that's what makes it more interesting. Um, and again, I know you said you did um, gravity by a Joe Miranda a few weeks ago, and I love gravity so much. And the first thing that I did is I just sat down and I made, I made a load of weird, bizarre tricks. And one of them was just a page turning over on its own in a book, like a really simple trick or a match flying out of a matchbox on its own. So you get someone to light a match, blow it out. When it's burnt in the box, one of them flies out and it's that one. Just those little ways of thinking. But because I, my brain works with bizarre tricks and I, I'm always creating bizarre tricks, the first thing that my mind went to is, well, if I had something that could move something invisibly, that feels a bit spooky. So it makes common sense to make a like a book page in a book turn on its own or or something like that. So... Yeah, I think the more that you just just think in a certain way, if you if you want to be a creator and create things or, um, you know, act a certain way, just keep looking at things in those ways and it will just become more natural, I think, in the end. Perfect. That's a, that's some really great advice as well. Now, this is a masterclass. I hope people realise that are watching this just how valuable the information is that you're giving away here, Jamie. Thank you so much. I hope I haven't wasted anyone's time and I haven't babbled too much. Hell no. Hell no. Um, I'm going to ask you one last question. And it's <laughs> the question that I ask absolutely everybody that comes on this channel, which is what's next for Jamie Dawes? Is there something left on your magical bucket list that you haven't done yet that you want to achieve? Because you've done so much. You're revered around the whole of the world as an exceptional creator um you've redefined an entire industry with bizarre magic you you I, I would be willing to bet that there's nobody in the world that has created as much bizarre material as you i, I can't even imagine anybody that that has i might be wrong but from my knowledge base i don't think there is 
Um, but I mean, you, you, you know, you you are so revered in the magic community. I, you've done so much. Your legacy is set. Is there anything left that you want to do? What are your plans for the future? Um, my my thing is lecturing. Like I really, I used to hate the idea of lecturing. Then it was Dave Loosely who basically said, you, you just need to start lecturing um, because you've got so much material. Um, if you want to start getting your material out in the world, it's a great way to sort of spread your brand. Um, and I've got, I, over the years, where, again, a throwback to what I said earlier on, and you'll know this 100%, over the years, you, you talk to so many different magicians and you work with them in different ways. And I've got so many people in the States, for example, who I've worked with over the years and they come over here for Blackpool and stuff like that, but I've never been out there to see them. So I think what I would really like to do is to maybe go to the States or, or to Europe um, and start going to lectures and actually meeting these people that, you know, invest in every trick that I put out. It would be so cool to actually meet these people and, you know, to say thank you to them for their support and everything that they do for me and my, my magic and my brand. Yeah. Um, so yeah, for me, um, the aim is to start lecturing. I'm going to try and do a, um, an American le uh, virtual lecture tour this summer, but it will be the first lecture that I do solely on bizarre magic because I've never seen a lecture at a club, which is bizarre magic. Um, and even if you're not into bizarre magic, it's still interesting to watch, someone else's point of view or perspective or different kind of trick um yeah yeah and also there's so many lessons that we can learn as performers by watching somebody who performs bizarre material because i think the problem with a lot of magicians is they focus on technique they you know they they, they make it less about the entertainment and more about the moves not everybody, but I've never seen that happen with a bizarre magician. It's always first and foremost presentation, engaging the audience and techniques are used, but only because they need to be. It's the simplest approach. That tends to be the case. Yeah, absolutely. I would say, could you imagine if a filmmaker only obsessed on the movement of the camera and not how, how good someone was acting or the storyline or the aesthetics of, of what they were doing or the music, you know, there's, there's in every other creative industry, you know, the way that that's portrayed to the audience, like a canvas on art and stuff like that. Um, whereas we don't think of it like that. We're, we're just more concerned about the technique. It's not, it is, I mean, technique is really important. Don't get me wrong, but performance is what brings the technique to life at the end of the day. Yeah. That's what makes it magical. The, yeah. the technique alone isn't magical. It's the way you're portraying it, which is. Absolutely. 100%. Um, yeah, I mean, there's going to be a lot coming out from you. You're, you're publishing, uh, you're self-publishing a trick every single month. If trying people, if people want to get on your mailing list and see the material that you've got coming out how can they do that i'm going to put a url at the bottom of the screen right now uh so you just go to jamiedoors.co.uk forward slash shop and if you scroll down in the middle there's a mailing list section and i will say that as i mean last year when the pandemic hit um i was a very early adopter of like virtual shows and zoom and working out the tech um, and I actually set up a massive web page. I basically took any old download, things that I'd unpublished that I didn't think anyone was interested in, but someone might. Um, and I just built this massive web page of just material that people could have for free. Um, and the response from it was amazing. Uh, so it was called Occupy Your Mind. So as a thank you to like the support of everyone over the past like year, over the next three months, I'm going to give everyone on my mailing list a free trick. So I'm going to film it. Um, it will be in a download format and then they'll re receive an email with the link and then they can just download it and watch it. So there's literally no purchase. It's just there for you, you to have and either enjoy or not enjoy, um, but it will be there. Um, so if you want that sort of stuff, then just sign up um, for free. There's no purchase or anything. It's just a little way to, to give back to everyone.
That's brilliant. Um, and so that's where you can get your your material that you publish yourself. Obviously, you've got a whole bunch of stuff on Alakazam. If you just go on Alakazam and search Jamie Dawes, a lot of a lot of magic will come up. Just and you, yeah, and you've shared with me some of the stuff that you've got coming out over the next few weeks and months. Uh, the thing that you've got coming out soon with Kmar Magic is incredible. I had a sneak peek of it just. It's unbelievable. Yeah, uh, very great. very cool it's gonna be great that's that's been another one it's been we've been working on it for maybe six months plus um and we're now at the stage where we've got we've got all the props we just need to film the trailer essentially but um that one tailed off the back of like the cluedo the clued up sort of thing it, it was kind of being developed at the same time and when you see them both you'll understand what i'm on about there um but yeah it's it's I'm really excited for it. I really, really am. I can't wait for it to come out. Yeah, that's 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 killer. So there's a whole bunch of stuff coming out, and and obviously you've teased something else that's coming out through Alakazam at some point in the future. So, Jamie, I I know we're going to be seeing a lot more of you. Uh, I know you're not going anywhere, mm -hmm. and you know what? I really appreciate you coming on the channel. You're an amazing guy, and I want everybody who's watching this to support Jamie. Go and jump on his mailing list buy some of his products because Jamie, you are one of the good guys in magic. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me as well. And thank you for all the content as well. Taking people's minds off of everything. I try. I try. Thank you for noticing. I appreciate it. Jamie, we'll see your comments, guys. So if you want to leave a comment, please do so down below. And uh, remember, if you want to see uh, if you want to see more videos like this, do three things. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, leave a comment down below. Uh, we're doing 24 videos a, month, a week. Uh, got three videos coming up tomorrow, one at two, one at six, one at nine. Um, so yeah, I'll see you guys again tomorrow at some point in the day. Jamie, one more time. Thanks very much for watching. Thanks for Bye -bye. being here.